Again, good morning. Everybody talks about Internet of Things. And uh, so yesterday and day before yesterday, I presented a couple talks about Internet of Bio Nano Things. And yesterday about the industrial uh, perspective. And today I will tell you about uh, Nano Things. And uh, uh, if you're interested, there are these two papers that uh, you can take a look and uh, see the, de uh, the details. I started the nano research, nano scale machines, communications almost 10, 12 years ago, like 2006. And as you see here, uh, Scientific America uh, published this article about top 10 emerging technologies of 2016, Internet of Things goes nano. And uh, so in the beginning I had problems to convince people. They said this is too far out. And now, as you see, that's one of the top 10 emerging technologies. Uh, you know, everybody talks about IoT. Maybe there are some people that they don't know what IoT is, really. So internet connects all people. We are talking about the classical internet. And IoT connects all things that you can see about in this picture. What are the things? They could be also defined as objects or machines like sensors, actuators, mobile phones, electronic devices, home appliances, any existing items, bottles, chairs, you know, tables, humans, they can be defined as things or objects. They'll be connected to each other and, uh, and they will use the internet as the backbone to support the entire communication of all these objects and things. The IoT uh, terminology was uh, introduced by Kevin Ashton. He's, he's a British entrepreneur, not a professor or a researcher. And he coined the terminology of IoT in almost 20 years ago. And uh, he was referring to RFIDs as the things objects. And uh, he was talking about how these RFID devices can be connected to create this uh, entire global network. And uh, a lot of people did research, especially on RFIDs and, and sensors, right? And uh, the current internet has 700 million hosts and 1.4 billion users. And now we are talking about how can we have trillions of things uh, connected to each other. And in case you are aware of these 5G cellular systems, they have a bunch of plans, like the latency should be reduced, the millimeter waves, and the security, and all these things. But also, the Internet of Things will be a major part of the 5G systems between 2020 and 2030. And they're talking about billions of people and trillions of things will be connected, and they will be supported by the 5G cellular systems. So you can imagine the enormous network with all these devices and people. And scale of it is the biggest problem, right? And of course, security and all the other issues. So you see here that uh, the things are connected. That means we are trying to create a world where the physical world and information world will meet and they will communicate with each other. Okay. So you see here, uh, during 2008, the number of things connected to the internet exceeds the number of people on Earth. So now you can see, by 2020, there will be 50 billion. So there will be more things and machines connected than the humans on Earth. So as I explained to you, one of the major subjects of 5G cellular systems, there will be 7 billion of people and seven trillion of things be connected. So as you see also here, the enabling technologies of IoT, so the RFID, it was mentioned by Kevin Ashton, to identify and track the data of things. The RFIDs are dumb devices. You have a gun and then you just uh, uh, shoot it to the uh, RFID and it reflects back to you the information. 
And there are these sensors and actuators. They sense things, they can process, they can store, they can communicate so that they can collect and process the data and inform the users or the end uh, uh, devices. And then there are so-called uh, smart tech thinking things. So yesterday I was mentioning you can put anything in the front like smart, smart meters, smart cars, smart rooms, smart this, smart that. So these are the smart things, meaning we are injecting intelligence into these devices. And the future goes also to the shrinking things. That means this part is based on the microtechnology, like microchips, etc., right? And now how can we reduce these micro things to the nano things? And that's where the nanotechnology comes into picture. Because there are a lot of applications, for example, health. That's what I discussed about on two days ago. Uh, you know, you don't want to put all the sensors inside your body that is micro level or outside of the body even. And also, one of the obstacles why we do not have a trillion dollar business or trillion euro business is the micro sensors and actuators are too intrusive. You don't want to, have, you don't want to see all these devices, they are intrusive. Because you know, you know the, the sizes are all those small, but you, know, you don't want to put them everywhere, right? So they, we need to somehow make them f almost invisible in the microtechnology, I mean through the nanotechnology. So I'm sure uh, you heard about nanotechnology, and also France is very active in nanotechnology, and as well as the entire Europe, the world. So what is the nanotechnology? It enables the control of matter in atomic and molecular scale. And at this scale, the material people which develop these nanomaterials show, uh, uh, solve that they detected some new properties. They were not observed at the microscopic level. And then they said, can we use these nanomaterials, exploit those properties, and develop new devices and applications? So what they do is they try to uh, develop these nanoscale things or machines, as you see here. There are two tracks. The top one is the one that I talked about. Can we use machines which are in the nature, biological machines like human cells, like eukaryotic cells, or prokaryotic cells like bacteria, and can we mimic them and artificially create nanoscale machines? And these are bio-inspired machines that they are compatible with the human body. You can inject in, in your body and then they can attack all types of illnesses and tumors and hopefully they will extend the lifespan of the people. And then there is the other track. It's uh, based on the nanomaterials that uh, you can develop new devices. Not the classical materials, but uh, nanomaterials. Like you create nanotransceivers, nanoantennas, nanoprocessors, nanomachines, etc. as you see here. And then you uh, uh, create a kind of like nanoscale machines, right? So that's the bio-inspired design I was telling you. Here on the left-hand side, you see a nanoscale machine. All of these computer components that you see there, like antennas, memories, etc., they'll be all nanoscale level. And you see these brushes. They're, for example, zinc oxide wires. They're also nanomaterial. And they tremble, and they can harvest energy. That's one way to do this. So uh, there are other ways of using other nanomaterials to develop also all these components. By the way, this machine is not existing as of yet in, in the entire world, but the components are existing. Okay? So like the processors, like your uh, latest uh, uh, laptops have uh, nanotransistor technology, like 20 to 30 nanometers. Nano uh, storage memories existing, like your 
iPhones, like they have these nano SIM card, right? But it's very primitive so far. So these are existing, and uh, so uh, uh, we are uh, visualizing. This was like almost eight years ago. We are about to create this net, uh, this device, by the way. So that's we are trying to put everything on the platform, like six by two by one micrometer. So if you never heard of this nanomaterial, uh, uh, you should really investigate this. It's called graphene in French, graphene. Uh, it will dominate our lives in the next 50 years, by the way. It's like some of you may remember, plastic was not here in the 50s, or aluminum. So they all changed our lives, right? Same thing will be with uh, graphene. This is a one atom thick planar sheet of bonded carbon atoms in a honeycup crystal lattice. So it's so thin, it's like less than one nanometer. And normally everything is 3D in our lives, right? But these are called 2D crystals, two dimensional, okay? So the inventors are Andrei Gaim and uh, uh, Konstantin Novoselov, two Russians from uh, St. Petersburg. They defected to UK. They are professors at the University of Manchester. They received the Nobel Prize in Physics as graphene inventors. I, I was actually expecting them 2017 this year, but they got it much earlier. So they, uh, the graphene can take any forms, like these carbon nanotubes, for example, graphene nanoribbons, or fullerene or buckyballs, as you see here, they can take different forms. It has excellent <coughs> futures characteristics. First do the crystal ever known to the mankind, only one of them thick. World's thinnest and lightest material. World's strongest material, harder than diamond, 300 times stronger than steel. It's bendable, it conducts electricity much better than fiber and copper transparent material and very good sensing capabilities. <clears throat> because of all these nice characteristics, you can use these to develop new technologies, right? For example, ITs, devices like processors, memories, etc. as I told you. However, the story doesn't end here. So you can build graphene-based planes because it will be very light and then you can accordingly save a lot of uh, fuels, for example. Or you can build cars. You can build uh, tennis rackets, anything you can imagine, uh, laptops or refrigerators, right? So that's why I'm telling you <coughs> it will really dominate our lives. And also you can have, <coughs> sorry, you can also create shirts for military and uh, police forces uh, you know, because it's, uh, as you see here, uh, you can, it's like bulletproof, okay? So these are all examples that you can use these graphenes, okay? So one month ago, I was invited to Lisbon for, uh, uh, by NSF and European community people. They want to see some vision for the future, okay? My vision for future is, those yellow, they, I have different backgrounds, so you cannot see them. So my vision for re, uh, future is everything will be speech driven. I'm sure you hear about Siri, right? It's very primitive. Or Alexa by Amazon. So our kids will think that with all these iPads and iPhones and these things, uh, uh, laptops, they will say, whoa, such a primitive technology. Because you type, here's typing now, and uh, you drive and type, it's crazy. Why can't we use everything uh, uh, speech driven, right? So like here's an example, as am I talking to you, like as if you're next to me, I don't need to use anything around me, right? No iPhone, nothing. Just I just talk. Do this, do that, right? So that's the objective. So how can we realize this? Did you think about it? Right? So here's an example. I, again, you don't want to have all these things around you, Bluetooth and all that. That's really stupid, right? It's too intrusive. 
Actually, I don't like that. People. Anyhow, so can we have nanophones, not microphone, nanophones, and you put them in the ear or also around your body, whatever, because they're invisible, right? And then you talk as if you are using your iPhone. And then it will use the backbone internet and it can, uh, you know, call your friend or your wife or your husband, whatever, right? So as if the person is next to you, you are not using any device. And if you need any information, you just say, I need this, and the information will come to your ear. You don't need to worry about other people, right? So I hope you are getting the point. If not, it's okay. So, <laughs> But the problem is, like Siri, you ask Siri something, it gives you, ten to, you know, hundreds of different options because she's not that intelligent. Okay, same thing with Alexa. You have to repeat five times because each of us has different accents, right? The, the device doesn't get it. So, so we need to work on those. So, so everything should be uh, more uh, practical, more natural, and extending the functionalities of these technologies, right? So, so we need to develop pervasive and non-invasive devices. That means we want to put them everywhere, indoors, outdoors, outside, inside the persons. Inside the persons also. Two days ago I talked about it. It should not be you, you, uh, see, you know, visible to the naked eye, user friendly. That means voice driven, smarter, like intelligence, and self-powered. No more charging batteries, energy harvesting should be automatic. So how can we do all of this? So that's where we go with this Internet of Things uh, goes nano. So we want to put everywhere nano devices. Okay, here's an example. In fact, uh, we have a project, I will also mention this to you. We will create the entire environment, we call them hypersurfaces, metasurfaces. European community supports it with 8 million euros as future emerging technologies. So we have six, I'm also involved in Europe, by the way. So I create the center in Barcelona at UPC. So it's called hypersurfaces. As you see in the walls, everywhere we will have these hypersurfaces with all these nanoscale components in them, okay? And also on the body everywhere. And when I talk, these nanoparticles can also send, use any of these, you know, walls and street poles and home outside. And then, uh, you know, we'll have this Fantastic communication environment, right? So I'm telling you all the future now. So, and then also inside the body we will have these bio nano things. They are biocompatible, as I explained to you. And even your health will always be monitored. If there are any problems inside your body, they can alarm outside, right? And then everything must, can go to your physicians. I'm not telling you science fiction, by the way. They're all doable. Of course, we need some time, right? So, no more of these devices around us, please. Okay? Even like this year, like everybody talks about vehicular networks, right? And it's, it's really sad because so many accidents are happening now. People are trying to look, oh, I got a message, or trying to type things. So why not having everything automatic? Like also the car has all this setup and you just talk and then you get the information. It's like, you know, maybe you remember Star Trek in the past, they always interacted like, you know, uh, with voice. So that's the way that we need to go. So let's go back to this uh, design of none of things. All of these components were existing when I started to, not, not all of them, but except uh, these antennas and the Transceivers were missing. So that's what we uh, started this project. Okay, I will not explain all the details. It was uh, started as Granite from the US Army. And then we uh, uh, got NSF funding. Then I got European Community funding. I got Finnish Academy of Science funding in Finland. So th this is still going on with terahertz, for example. So. So what we did is we developed these nanotransceivers and nanoantennas, 
we received very fast the patents. Uh, the nano antenna patent was locked by the CIA almost two years, one and a half years, and then they released it finally. And so we have the patents and the same thing with the nanotransceivers. So then the question was, so when we have this device as nano thing, nano machine, how will they communicate? And we realized that graphene-based material, that's what we do, graphene-based, they communicate in very high frequencies. So like terahertz, like 500 gigahertz and up. For lower frequencies, the electromagnetic waves do not glide as we wish. So we investigated the terahertz channel, and we did all this theory. We also developed uh, uh, these uh, you know, physical layer uh, solutions, because uh, uh, terahertz is really a peculiar environment. So that's why uh, uh, all of these new solutions we came up with. And all these issues about addressing, int uh, routing, relaying, etc., they are still open. So mainly we focus on the physical layer and MAC layer, and all for the device layer, okay, device level. So wh what we realized is, maybe I have it here, uh, Yeah, so this is too much now. What happened here? Yeah. Uh, so these are the basic ideas about the antenna. We are using, I don't know, we have physics people here. We use surface plasma and polarizing waves. They are gliding very smoothly in 100 gigahertz up to 10 terahertz bands. We developed these uh, uh, transceiver based on the HEMT, high electron mobility transistor idea. You always see that graphene is sitting on top of gallium nitride or gallium arsenide, dielectric materials, and then we uh, uh, have very powerful nanotransceivers. So this is the first uh, front end that ever existing in the world with uh, uh, the transceiver plus the antennas. So we also did this uh, uh, channel investigation when two nano devices are communicating in these very high frequencies, as you see here from say 100 gigahertz up to 10 terahertz, and the distance is this way, they are distance limited. That means when you go higher than one meter, the path loss is so bad, in, in case you've heard first time path loss, meaning the signal fades and you cannot have a meaningful communication. That's the red area. So they are distance limited. And if you are in a communication area, the same problem is existing for millimeter waves, 60 gigahertz. They're also a major part of the 5G systems. So distance limited. So we are trying to combat distance since almost eight years now. So we did some ideas about distance adaptive modulation to see those spikes, these yellow areas, to do like looking at the distances and trying to modulate the signals such a way we use these, uh, these sub-windows, we call them. Then uh, we try to use uh, so-called ultra-massive MIMO. We developed uh, 1,000 by 1,000 uh, antennas. We also received the patent it was pretty fast, like 16 months. It's really surreal. But we got it, ultra-massive MIMO with all these graphene-based antennas. So we can increase the, the distance using all these gigantic number of antennas to uh, tens of meters so that we increase the distance. Okay. So then uh, what did you learn? As I told you, the problem is some of you may think, why are they distance limited, right? So, there are water particles in the air. When you are s transmitting signals in those high frequencies, the water, water particles affect the signal propagation. And same thing happens in 60 gigahertz, where millimeter wave uh, communications are used. And there, the oxygen particles are messing up the signal propagation. 
But when you go higher, then water particles uh, mess up the uh, communication. But the advantage of this technology is you have huge bandwidth, like we are talking about 100 terabit per second, right? And this will really help us also for the Internet of uh, Things, right? Because we'll have very gigantic data, right? We will collect them, and that's, we need these very, very huge data rates, right? So how can we do lower frequencies, and also how can we combat the distance problem, as I told you, right? So uh, we, again, there are material people. I don't know if we have them here. I think there's most informatic here, right? So there are all these uh, material people. They are developing new materials, like you know, all this MOS2 or hexagonal bar nitride. So a lot of uh, activities are going on developing these nanomaterials, not just graphene, but more sophisticated nanomaterials. And, uh, uh, and also there is this uh, hier hierarchical base materials that uh, uh, is also investigated. Maybe some of you don't know. European community invested or invests 1 billion euros for emerging technologies one is the brain simulation, the other one is graphene. And the graphene, Andre Ferrari from University of Cambridge is the leading guy, and they have consortium, and they are like in the year three or four, they have many years to go, and those guys are doing all this material research. So then, how can we combat the distance problem? As I told you, there are so-called reflect arrays, but then they are not that sophisticated. They just reflect the signals, so that you can create higher distance or reach that. And then we have these hypersurfaces or metasurfaces. I explained to you that European Community supports us with eight million euros to realize these uh, hyper hypersurfaces. Again, graphene-based will create all these areas that I was telling you about, walls and uh, you know, outside, indoors and outdoors, we will create these environments which will support communications. Okay? So you can see they are very powerful, they will be very powerful. Okay? Uh, so we have a, a lot of people working on this, like six uh, partners, Fraunhofer Institute, Berlin, University of Cyprus, Fourth Greece, UPC in Barcelona and Alto in Finland. Uh, the front of for instance is Berlin. Okay? So I mean we have all these device people, material people, communications people, physics people, so it's a large group of people. So we have also this uh, uh, 1024 by 1024 antennas as I told you, uh, mass ultra massive MIMA we call it. That's why we just got the patent. Then uh, we have many challenges on this still about fabrication. Now we are fabricating all these transceivers, antennas, and the entire nanoscale machine. And then the next step will be, we, we did all the feasibility studies, simulation, they work. But now we need to physically produce those and fabricate them and it will be soon available. And that's what I was telling, keep telling you, like EU FET project, 17 to 2021, with all these, you know, uh, it's called Wiser Surf. If you are interested, you can check the wisersurf.eu, and you can read a lot of uh, information in that, uh, on that site. Now, as I told you, I'm also, not only me, but also Samsung, Intel, they're all working on these nano cameras, right? So we need, uh, also for the nano things that they should be able to take you know videos and you know uh, pictures etc right so uh, uh, nano photo detectors and nano lenses will help they will have gigantic very high pixel resolutions very high spatial resolutions and very high color resolutions it's very very sophisticated technology and these already existing nano lenses and nano photo detectors now, how to, you know, we have to somehow put them together as a network. And nanophones, uh, in fact, I was serving on the ERC European community last month, and one, uh, I cannot tell you, but one guy got this uh, a pro project about speech processing. 
because you know there are a lot of noises we don't hear that but you know when when you are my I had friends that had some problem with hearing and they couldn't use these devices because they said there are so many voices noises going on it's really terrible so that's why these devices should be prone to those problems so then I clean up all this, reduce all this extra noise, right? So that's, I hope you got it. Because when you talk, the machine should understand you without those interferences, right? So that they will have higher directional resolution, the surrounding effects, and higher frequency resolution, uh, frequency, the higher quality audio, right? So there are all these challenges. So in other words, Suppose we have all these nano things, right? We will mass produce them, all the nano devices. And there will be problems, first of all, for the communication support, we need to find a new IP addressing mechanism. How will we do that for these nano scale machines? Routing algorithms for informatic people, reliability, congestion control, energy consumption, security and privacy is uh, very, very uh, important. I will show you another slide and mobility. And then how will we connect the nano things to the bio nano things and micro things, right? All the interconnectivity will be a problem. Here is the last one. DARPA, uh, who, which invented the internet, right? 1969, I mean invent meaning they supported Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So they wrote this article four projects bigger than the internet, okay? That they will play a role in our lives. Atomic GPS, rapid threat assessment. You see here, second item is terahertz frequency electronics, devices, metamaterials, communication. That's exactly what I'm pre I presented to you. And the third one is, a virus shield for the Internet of Things. It was also discussed this morning, or I mean before. So how can we create a virus shield, not only Internet of Micro Things, but then the entire, uh, uh, this uh, uh, technology that I'm telling you about, the entire environment will be all these machines and communication uh, devices. So how can we protect those, like denial of service attacks, security authentications and all that. So as you see here, when you look forward 10, 15, 20 years, there are a lot of interesting directions. We have some young people here. I don't know how much research you do, but you know you do research like this epsilon, or you look forward and say, I want to do something very impactful. So if you want to do something impactful, that's the way to go. Okay. So thank you again for listening, and uh, hope some of you will be interested to do research on these.